How are you doing? Felt so sleepy and so long. Um, my spring break, this was it. I uh, I spent every day on my deck or basically sleeping on the couch, and so my whole getting up early thing went away. And then my wife had to get up this morning um, and get to work by 7:30, which meant I had to get up by 6. I don't I don't know if I can do this. All right, I can do this. If I'm being dramatic. Um, all right. Uh, how was your break? Pretty good. Good. Mine was super relaxing. I hope yours is relaxing too. I could have used maybe another week, but uh, we'll, we'll have to make this how it is. Uh, we, uh, my car, so my wife and I bought a Ford Escape about a year and a half ago. A little limit. And the uh, Ford Motor Company has now spent approximately $15,000 on this car because of the warranty. So we, they've replaced the engine. Oh, it's like, uh, yeah, no, it's been significant. It, it, was this a brand new car? It was a brand new car, yeah. So it, uh, they replaced them, which is actually not that big of a deal, I guess, because uh, it's got 25,000 miles on it, but now the engine's got zero. Yeah. But anyway, it broke again. The turbocharger's done. That's another 5,000 that Ford has to spend on. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's, that also happened. Uh, so our song today, Harder, better, faster, stronger. Today is a big day. Today is the day where we are really going to become organic chemists. Today is also the day where there is no falling behind. It's going to get pretty real over the next two weeks, and then we've got our midterm on the following Monday. Now, I said before um, that that's going to be the Monday after Easter. Uh, it's That's still the Monday after Easter. I, I couldn't change that. Um, but if you've got Easter plans and you need to delay that exam a little bit, just let me know. I'll work around. Um, we're still going to plan on the exam in class on Monday, but again, if you've got Easter plans and that's going to be a burden, um, then we'll, we'll work it out. Just let me know. I'm really flexible. Um, okay, I'm actually really pumped for next week. I love this topic. I had a lot of fun making the lecture yesterday. Um, we'll see, one last thing. So availability. My availability is going to be a little less this time than it was uh, on exam one. So next weekend, I'm going to be out of town. I wasn't, there's a wedding in Michigan that my wife was going to, and she wanted me to go, and stuff. So now I'm going, and I'm missing the first weekend of the NCAA tournament, but that's love. So, uh, it'll be fine. Um, how are the homework problems? If you can do the homework problems, you're probably in a pretty good spot. Um, I figure at the workshops, we're going to work on these quite a bit. Um, but yeah, this is why I'm saying this, this takes a lot of hands-on working on your own. Um, so I'm going to keep those coming. I'm also going to go ahead and get the practice exam for um, um, exam two up today, this afternoon hopefully, so you'll have at least a shot to, to see what that exam will look like. All right, any questions? So um, since, since I'm making these problems, um, and I'm probably going to end up going over most of these during the workshops, I'm probably not going to post it. And it plus the key, um, just because that would take me several hours to, to put together. I don't want to have to do that twice. But of course, I do post all the workshops. And so um, we, can, we can go with those pretty hard when we do have workshops. And I, of course, will post those as we go. So yeah, great question. OK, let's see. I think, I think that's it. So. Uh, today we start chapter six, and so chapter six is going to be alkenes for real, unlike chapter five, which is kind of a baby chapter. Um, chapter six, alkenes. So we will title it electrophilic addition, which I might refer to as EA reactions. And so this chapter is pretty much all reactions. We're going to learn. About out a bunch of reactions. This is the first time that we've really, uh, really been doing that, and so this is the first time we're really going to talk like we're organic chemists. But fortunately, I can say that we've sort of seen this material before, at least part of this material. And so I emphasized this back when we were doing acid-base chemistry. Um, and so, for example, what that looked like, we'll call this intro, this would be Roman numeral one. 
So we'll say letter A, what we have seen. All right, so I, I know back when we were doing acid base chemistry, I showed an example that looked maybe something like this. So we have an alkene, and then we react to that with an acid. All right, so we see HCl, we explicitly always think, well, that's going to be an acid for sure, which means that alkene is going to be what? It's going to be a base, and we've seen how it can react with a base. Now, we're also going to learn a little new terminology. All right, so in this case, when we draw this, well, first off, when we draw the reaction of these two things, where do we start our arrow? Yeah, we started at electrons, and, and what's the only place we have available electrons in this? Well, it's going to be on the base, right? And so, where, where is it alone? Do we have any lone pairs on the base? No, but we do have a pi bond, right? And so that pi bond, those electrons are further away from the nucleus and they're more available. And so we start our arrow always at electrons. We start these at the pi bond, and we'll draw them to the hydrogen. Okay, and so um, the new terminology we're going to start introducing is we're gonna, since we're taking our electron from our base and we're reaching out and grabbing a hydrogen or a proton, we're going to start calling it a nucleophile. All right, so we've got a nucleophile in this reaction. Basically, that is a lover of nuclei. All right, so we've got a lover of nuclei. And so we'll sometimes see this shortened to just maybe NU. Nucleophile is a long word, and we probably don't want to write it out a bunch of times. So we'll use NU for nucleophile. And of course, if we're going to start calling a base a nucleophile, we're also going to give a new name to the acid. And so what's that name? That's electrophile. That's a lover of? Electrons, and of course, the electrophile, the acid, the HA here, they're accepting electrons, and they love that because they're a lover of electrons. So we call this an electrophile, a lover of electrons. And so we'll just use maybe E. Sometimes you'll see that written as E plus. Um, but we'll, we'll probably just use E mainly here. Okay, so. The double bond, the electrons right here from our nucleophile, it attacks the proton. Why doesn't it attack the chlorine? Let's <coughs> well, think about the polarity of HCl. So is that a polar molecule? Yeah, it definitely is. And so we'll have a dipole where we've got a partial negative charge on the chlorine. So that gives us a partial positive charge on the hydrogen. And so that's why our nucleophile is going to be attracted to the H, right, of the HCl. So we get some more positive electrons want positive things. And so in this reaction, when our, when our electrons from the pi bond react with the hydrogen, we'll show that basically we've got an acid-base reaction where the Cl is going to keep its electrons. And I, I maybe not have done this in class yet, but when we're talking about electron movement, especially in acid-base reactions, I, I always consider like half the baton, okay? And so let's say that I'm an acid and I've got this thing, the baton, it's going to be my proton. Charlotte here is going to be my base, and so she's going to be protein. All right, so. My arm are my electrons holding this proton in my body, right? All right, so Charlotte, you grab that. Where's my arm go? It goes back. I always keep my arm, right? So we're going to do an acid-base reaction, but the acid, the thing that's holding, the electrons that are holding the proton and giving it away, they, they stay with that initial CL. So that's why the electrons with the chlorine, or the chlorine-hydrogen bond will always stay with the chlorine. Always hold on to your own arm. Okay, so we undergo this reaction. Why do we call this an electrophilic addition? Well, what's the, where does the electrophile come from? Yeah, we're taking an alkene and we're treating it with an electrophile, right? And so that's where the electrophilic part of these reactions, all these reactions are going to be basically us taking an alkene and treating it with an electrophile. And then we're going to see the addition bit here in, in just a second. Okay, so we do this part, and we've already seen what happens. We know that we're going to form what kind of species once we add the hydrogen to this double bond. Well, we have the hydrogen here to the left side, but what happens to the carbon on the right? <coughs> yeah. yeah, it's a carbocation, right? We end up with a positive charge plus our Cl minus here. All right, so we've definitely shown this when we did acid-base chemistry. And basically, because I showed this back when we did acid-base chemistry, we've seen this electrophilic addition already. We've already seen how we can take an acid, react it with a base that's just a pi bond here, or a nucleophile, and end up with a carbocation. OK, so here, 
Let's go one step further. We've always, we've always just kind of stopped here and said, well, this is an equilibrium. We've got acid base here and acid base here, and we're done. But in reality, let's think about what we've got. We've got a carbocation, which is really high in energy. It's open shell. It's got a positive charge. And then it's got a, there's a chloride here with a lot of electrons and negative charge. Let's imagine these things are magnets. What's going to happen? Yeah, they're going to immediately be attracted to each other, right? And so that's what happens. So we're going to draw reactions between our cation and our chloride. And where are we going to start our arrow? Yeah, at the Cl, right? We always start at electrons. And we certainly don't have electrons on the carbocation to start at. So we have to start with our, uh, with our chloride. And so we do that. We pick one of these electron pairs. Where are we going to draw it to? Yeah, who, what really wants electrons in this picture? Carbon. The carbocation. So we're going we're gonna to satisfy the carbocation. We're going to give it the electrons. So that's what we do. In this case, what's our nucleophile? It's the chlorine, all right? That's the thing that is donating electrons, just like over here. So here we've got a nucleophile donating electrons. Our nucleophile will always be donating electrons to some bit of positive charge. And so, of course, what's our electrophile? What loves electrons in this case? Definitely the carbocation. Okay. So the result of this reaction... <laughs> Will essentially be that we've taken our HCl and we've added it to our alkene, right? All right, so electrophilic, that comes from the fact that we're taking a double bond and treating it with an electrophile like HCl. <coughs> what about addition? Where does that come from? We're adding our HCl to the double bond. We end up with a product where basically we've got one H here, I'm sorry, one H here and one Cl. So there's our HCl now. It has been added to the double bond. That's pretty much an electrophilic condition. We just go one step further than the acid-base chemistry that we've already seen in class. Okay, so let's say that we're going to call an EA reaction, electrophilic addition reaction. It's going to be the reaction resulting from the addition of an electrophile with a positive. <coughs> All right, so that's going to be a, our electrophilic addition reaction. Now, in this case, we're using HCl as our electrophile. There could be a lot of different electrophiles, but in this case, all right, so our HCl starts out as an electrophile. And then it, so basically, once this hydrogen gets attacked, it kicks off this chloride, and the chloride ends up over here. Is it still an electrophile? No, now it's what? Now it's a nucleophile. So really what happens is in the first step of our reaction, an electrophile adds to our pi bond. And then in the second part of our reaction, a nucleophile is adding to our resulting carbocation. And so when we have something like HCl, we could say essentially we've got an electrophile attached to a nucleophile. And so ultimately what we're going to see is any of these electrophilic addition reactions just result from different combinations of electrophiles and nucleophiles. And we're going to learn basically over the next two weeks a lot of the nuances involved with how these things happen. Okay, so a gen very generic electrophilic aromatic, right, I'm sorry, electrophilic addition reaction would look something like we have a pi bond. We have an electrophile nucleophile combo like HCl. And so essentially, we'll just add that combination to our double bond or our alkene. OK, so that's our intro. It's basically just an extension of what we've done already. We know that we treated pi bond with an acid. We get a carbocation, and now we more or less stabilize that carbocation by joining the resulting product with the carbocation. All right, so there's a little bit of complexity that goes into these reactions, and so I'm going to give a brief overview of what that complexity is. So we'll say that really two important considerations that we're going to have to take or have to think about as we do these is that in this case I've shown 
or at least in our first reaction I've shown where we're going to form one product. There's one product possible, but that's not always going to be the case. And so a lot of times what we'll find is that multiple products are often possible in EA reactions. All right, so there's going to be two important considerations that we talk about when we try to determine what multiple products are going to be possible. So the first consideration we'll talk about is going to be, going to be what we call regiochemistry. And so I'll just show that with an example. So let's say our double bond looks something like this. All right, so we've got a double bond that's inside of a ring. So we've got a cyclohexene ring. And you can see one of these carbons has a methyl group attached to it. And so if we treat that with an electrophile-nucleophile combo, we've got two possibilities. We could add the electrophile here to the top, the nucleophile to the bottom, or we could go vice versa. We could add the nucleophile to the top and the electrophile to the bottom. Now, are those the same molecule? Because they're certainly not the same. What is the relationship between these molecules? Are they stereoisomers? No, they are constitutional isomers, right? They have the same number of atoms and bonds. They just are connected differently. So we've got constitutional isomers. All right, so essentially what we'll talk about when we talk about all of the different EA reactions that we do, we'll talk about their regioselectivity. <coughs> So when we talk about regioselectivity, we, what we'll find is that some EA reactions prefer one product over another. And so a lot of times what you'll be asked is, is not to draw all the possible products, but you'll, you'll be asked to draw what is the most favorable product, what is the most likely product to form. And so we're going to talk about you know, in detail how we can determine all right, so that's regioselectivity. And so if we've got regiochemistry as number one, what do you think number two is going to be? What did we spend the last two weeks talking about? Stereochemistry. And so that's going to be number two. Now you can see why we do stereochemistry before we do EA reactions. It's because it's important. We can end up with different stereoisomers. And so to show that, let's draw this product or this reactant. So we're going to draw arrows. We're going to have one going this way. We'll have one going this way. And so in both cases, we're going to react with an electrophile-nucleophile combo. And so we're going to call this the reaction going to the left the anti-reaction. We'll call the reaction to the right the sin reaction. And so what we find is that in this direction, what we could do is we could add Essentially such that the electrophile and the nucleophile are on opposite sides of the rings, right? And so, in addition to that, we could also show this product that looks like that. Are those the same molecule? Those are not the same molecule. What's the relationship between those molecules? All right, so we've got two chiral centers. And so are they both flipped when we look from one to the other? <coughs> so if there's electrophile on the dash here, but it's on the wedge here, has that been flipped? Yeah. What about if we go from the nucleophile wedge to the nucleophile dash? Yes. It's, they're both flipped, which means they're what? Yeah. They're enantiomers, right? They're mirror images of each other. And so what you find is you can never superimpose those things. Likewise, if anti is where they add to opposite sides, what do you think sin is? Yeah, they're going to add to the same side. And so in that case, what we could end up with is both on a wedge, or we could end up with both on a dash. Okay, are those the same molecule? Yes. Yes. 
So if we think they are, let's see, we have to flip it over, right? Because these are on a dash and we need these to be on a work. But if we flip this over 180 degrees, the nucleophile will now switch to the left side, right? And so that, are they the same molecule? No. They're not. What is their relationship? So <coughs> again, they're antimers, right? Because we've gotten from a wedge to a dash and a wedge to a dash. And so we flip both stereo centers and we know that that's going to be an antimers. All right, so in this case, depending on the stereo chemistry, you can see there's actually four different possible products. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, in most cases, we're not going to form four different products, but I just wanted to kind of show that it's possible, and so we need to figure out, essentially, as we go, which products are going to be forming. All right, so that leads us to stereo selectivity. So what we'll find is that in addition to regioselectivity, some EA reactions <coughs> prefer either sin or anti. All right, so you'll find EA reactions that prefer sin addition. You'll find EA reactions that prefer anti. And then some don't have any preference. So some have no preference. So those are going to be the more complicated cases. Well, well there's four possible products, and then we need to figure out um, what we'll form. <laughs> okay, so we've got these two really important considerations that we want to take into account whenever we're talking about EA reactions. So what do you think it is that's ultimately going to determine you know, whether an EA reaction has this or that regio selectivity or this or that stereo selectivity? It's going to be the process, the actual uh, movement of electrons that are going on um, during a reaction. So what do we call that? We call it a mechanism. All right, so both of the above depend on a reaction's mechanism. So we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about them. Now, here's the good news. We're going to learn, I don't know how many reactions, 10 or 12, something along those lines. Guess how many reaction mechanisms we're going to learn? Three. There's going to be three reaction mechanisms. So despite the fact that we're going to learn 10 or 12 reactions, what we need to, be, what we need to keep in mind is those are all going to fit into one of three groups. And so whichever group it fits into, that's the mechanism, and that will determine the regiochemistry and the stereochemistry. So there's really three things that we're going to focus on, or at least three different mechanisms. So we'll say that there are three types of mechanisms, so that's going to be the, the important thing we talk about. All right, so we're going to get right to it. We're going to go ahead and say Roman numeral number two is going to be mechanism type one. We'll just say type one like that. All right, and so. We're going to give this thing a nickname. Any type 1 mechanism we're going to talk about, we're going to give it the nickname of, this is really creative, carbocation. All right, that's our nickname. If we ever talk about a carbocation mechanism, we're going to know we're going to be talking about a type 1 mechanism. What do you think is the identifying factor of a type 1 mechanism? It goes through a carbocation. That's going to be by far the most important thing about this mechanism. That's why we're going to call it a carbocation mechanism. So. We'll call that the carbocation mechanism. You'll sometimes see carbocation is shortened to C plus, and so that's just indicating carbocations. Now we're starting to see why carbocations. We didn't just kind of sh shoo those off to the side. Those are actually really important things that have a big role in organic chemistry. Okay, so let's talk about the mechanism of a reaction or an EA reaction that goes through a carbocation. So what we're going to do is uh, let's do this. So I'm actually going to start with an energy diagram. Need to get to know energy diagrams fairly well. All right, so we've got energy on the y-axis. We'll reaction progression on the x-axis. And so what we'll do is we'll say, well, we have something on the left and something on the right. And I'm going to show the product is, is lower in energy. Um, it, it's not going to matter too much for the things we talk about. But all right, so we've got on the left side, SM. What's SM? It's starting material, or we could say reactancy. But either way, so that's going to be our starting stuff, right? That's where we start before any reaction is taking place. And so the stuff on the right side of our energy diagram is what? 
often called the PDT test. What is that? Products, right? So we've got our products on the right side and our reactants on the left side. And so the mechanism is essentially everything that's going to take place between the left side and the right side. Now, we've already said the type 1 mechanisms. What's the most important factor? Carbocation. They go through a carbocation. And so that's going to happen. We're going to have to see a carbocation on our energy diagram. Now, compare your starting material on our products. A carbocation. More stable or less stable? Less stable. Less stable. Lower energy or higher energy? Definitely higher in energy, and so that's exactly what we'll see. So we'll draw that there. That's going to be our carbocation. So that's where we'll draw a C plus. Okay. So what we have is our mechanism. We basically map by showing how we get from one thing to another. So basically, we're going to have to climb one hill and then go down the other side, at least partially, get to, to get to our carbocation, and from there, we're we'll up a smaller hill and end up down in our products. Okay, so our carbocation, this thing right here, is gonna be an example of, well, we're gonna actually, we're gonna have two things. We're gonna have what we call intermediates. We're gonna have what we call transition states. And so a carbocation, is that gonna be an example of an intermediate or a transition state? It's an intermediate, so we, the, the way that you tell the difference between intermediates and transition states are whether they're at the top of the hill or they're in a valley. And so an intermediate is going to be a valley. It's going to be an energy minimum. All right, so our carbocation, we see, sits in a valley, and so we know that it is a, an intermediate. Transition states on the other side are going to be our mountain peaks. And so those are going to be energy maximum. All right, so. In this case, this what we'd call a two-step reaction because we have basically two hills to climb. How many intermediates do we go through from starting material to product? In this case, we go through one, right? We just go through our carbocation intermediate. How many transition states do we go through? Yeah, we go through two in this case. All right, so what we'll do is we'll call this, we use this symbol right here. And so this is the symbol used to indicate transition states. It looks kind of like a fissure projection, I guess. But yeah, it's straight, straight up and down the line and struck through with two horizontal lines. Yeah. If the carbocation is so high on the, on the energy chart, why is that an energy chart? Um, because you can imagine, I always like to use the idea of like popping popcorn, right? And so all of our all of our atoms have different amounts of energy. And so um, I like to think of it as popcorn popping around. And every now and then, some of that popcorn is going to have enough energy that it can get up over the first pump, right? And so it does so, and it slides down. All right, and it slides down, and it ends up right there as the carbocation, right? And it spends some amount of time as the carbocation, but it needs another bit of energy to get out of being a carbocation. And so because it's at an energy minimum, it means that we're actually going to spend a little bit of time as that carbocation. So that actually exists for some length of time. Yep. Okay, um, so a really important part in talking about these things right here. All right, so we have this energy difference between our starting material and our highest transition state. Now, who remembers from Chem 103 what we call that? Activation energy. That's the activation energy. And so what we're also, all right, so let's, we can name that EA. What we're also going to refer to for our EA, actually, let's call it RDS. What's an RDS? A rate determining step. And so basically, our rate determining step is going to be the highest transition state energy. And so in this case, when we talk about the activation energy, we say that, well, that's going to be our rate determining step. The hardest transition that we're going to go through as we go from our starting material to our product is going to be climbing that first hill, going up that first activation energy, because once we get to the top, it's pretty much, for the most part, all downhill from there. Once we get to our carbocation, it's going to be easier to keep going right. We've gotten over the big part of the hill, right? If you set a ball right here and just let it go to the right, you can imagine just funneling on down to the product. You're not going to get stuck anywhere. So once we get over that highest transition state energy, Basically, it's downhill from there. So what we call that is going to be our rate-determining step. 
<laughs> so that's because when we talk about the EAs we're talking about, do we, do we consider that a thermodynamic or a kinetic property? So thermodynamic is when we talk about a state function like delta G, but are, do we care about the path now? Are we just worried about energy here and energy here? Or are we actually worried about you know, the ups and downs and how we get from one side to the other? Yeah, we're now worried about the ups and downs. And so the rate determining step, or when we talk about activation energy, that's going to be kinetics. And so basically, when we talk about a transition state energy or an activation energy, that is a rate determining step that's telling us how fast our reaction will take place. All right, so that's going to be important as we see. So let's draw a picture. Let's draw a picture of what's actually going on in this reaction. So for our starting material, let's say we start with, we're using the same reaction we've been using. So we've got this starting material. We're going to have some electrophile, nucleophile combination. And so we know that when we do this reaction, we're going to start with our pi bond. It's going to act as a nucleophile. It's going to give our electrophile. Now, what we want to show first is the transition state. We've never drawn out a transition state. So what is the transition state really indicating? So in this case, what we're showing is the actual bond formation and breaking for that first step of the formation of our carbocation. So what bond is forming when we talk about this first step? Formation between the electrophile and the carbons. Yeah, so we're basically forming a bond between one of these carbons and the electrophile. And so that's now what we show just with a dotted line like that. So basically, we're starting to form. What we're talking about is that transition state at the very top. All right, so likewise, as we're forming our bond between our carbon and our electrophile, what's happening with the bond between the electrophile and the nucleophile? It's breaking, right? And so if we indicate one with a dot, how do you think we indicate the other? Just another dot. All right, so. What we have is that. So basically, we're showing the, the halfway point of our first step of the formation of our carbocation. We're finding that we're forming a new bond here between the carbon and the electrophile, and then the electrophile and the nucleophile bond is beginning to break. And so we'll always put this in brackets, and then we'll put our little transition state symbol right there to the side. All right, we, do we have a complete picture here? What are we lacking? Well, we do, of course, lack the nucleophile. Well, we don't lack, lack the nucleophile. What about all the bond forming and breaking? Are we showing everything going on? Yeah, we're losing the pi bond. So how do you think we're going to show losing the pi bond? A dotted pi bond? Same exact way. We're going to show a dotted pi bond. So ultimately, our transition state is kind of the middle point of all these things happening at one point. And so when we finally get over to the, trend, or to the intermediate, we can see how now we end up <laughs> This picture right here. Okay, so we finally gotten over to carbocation, and we now see the transition state. Whenever we talk about the transition state, we can see what's going on. All right, so of course, from going to the carbocation to the product, is it is it completely down here, down there, or do we have to go through another transition state? Another transition state. So if we're going to show that mechanistically, we know that well, we're going to take our nucleophile. We're going to add that to our carbocation, but of course, we have to go through a transition state, so we want to show that again using a transition state. So we've already formed our, our bond on the left side, so nothing changes there. On the right side, we had a carbocation, but now we're forming a bond with a nucleophile. So how do we indicate that developing bond? Dotted line, just like that. And we indicate that this is a transition state. So we're halfway to basically attaching our nucleophile to our carbon, and so ultimately what we end up with is a product. <coughs> that looks like this. Okay, so this is our basic mechanism. It's, it's two steps, right? We basically we form our carbocation, and that's gonna be the thing we always keep in mind. And then there's gonna be two transition states, basically. Uh, between 
the carbocation starting material and the carbocation and product. And so what we want to think about now is, well, how does this carbocation actually influence any of the things that we've talked about at the beginning, such as regiochemistry or stereochemistry? And so this will be letter B. Maybe it's a letter A. <coughs> now, we'll, we'll call this letter A. This will be letter B, and so we're going to consider it regio selective. And so as I said all along, what do we care most about in these type 1 mechanisms? C plus, carbocation. It's the same thing here. It's going to indicate what happens. So we'll say that our regio selectivity is all about our C plus formation. And we'll add in parentheses stability. Okay, so let's think about our part because what we can have happen. All right, so consider we have a starting material that looks like this. All right, so there's our starting material. And so we're going to react that with some electrophile, nucleophile combo. Okay, so we've got two possibilities. So first off, we're going to show each, each intermediate that can happen. And so the intermediate in a type 1 mechanism is what? There's one intermediate. It is a carbocation. carbocation. And so when we make two products, we know, well, we're going to add the electrophile first. Now what we could do is we could add the electrophile to this carbon, which is going to put a carbocation right there. Or we could go the other way, and we could add our electrophile right there, which then, of course, would put the carbocation on that top carbon. All right, so let's think about what types of carbons we've got here. All right, so the carbocation on the top, if we're going to use our primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary terminology, what kind of carbocation is that? How many carbons is the carbocation attached to? Two? Yeah, so if we start here, we find there's one carbon here, then there's one carbon there, and so it's a what kind of carbon? Secondary. It's a secondary, and so... What's going to help us out a ton is if we think about whether these are primary, secondary, tertiary. They're going to be important to the ultimate regiochemistry. What about the bottom example? What kind of carbocation is it? <laughs> it's a tertiary, right? So that's because we've got, well, here's our carbocation. We've got one carbon here, one carbon there, and one carbon there. And so it's connected to three carbons. So we'll refer to that as a tertiary carbocation. Okay, so we know what happens next. We've got our nucleophile floating around, we're just going to react with the electrophile, and so, I'm sorry, nuclear, yeah, and so what we end up with is in the top case, where's our nucleophile going to go? Wherever yeah, wherever the carbocation was, it's always going to attach to that carbocation, and so we end up with nucleophile there, or likewise, the bottom product, it again <coughs> will just attach wherever that carbocation was. Okay, so how do we indicate which product is favored? Is there a difference in those carbocations? There definitely is. One's a secondary carbocation, one is a tertiary, tertiary carbocation. That is all the information we need to know to determine what is the stable product or the more favored product. And so which is it, the top or the bottom? It is the bottom. We're gonna talk about why. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and give you the punchline. The bottom product is going to be the more favored product. And so what that means, let's think about the tertiary carbocation versus the secondary carbocation. If we know that the bottom product is more favored, what's going to be the more stable carbocation? What has to be the more stable carbocation? The bottom one. All right, and so we're going to talk about why that's the case right now. So why do we form the bottom product? So what we're going to have is we're going to have an energy diagram. Now our starting material is the same, and our products are pretty close in energy, so we don't care about what's going on with the starting material or with the products. What we do care about is what's going on with the carbocation. Now I've already said, which is a more stable carbocation, secondary or tertiary? Tertiary. Definitely tertiary. And so when we draw those two intermediates on an energy diagram, which goes lower in energy? <coughs> which is more stable? Tertiary. Tertiary. And so we draw the tertiary as lower in energy. So we've got a tertiary, we'll call it a prime carbocation, and so of course we need to show the secondary carbocation as well. And so when we talk about the mechanism, the pathway for getting from starting material to product, 
In one case, in the case of the secondary carbocation, we have to go way up this hill and back down. And then from there, we can funnel back down to our products. Or we could go to a tertiary carbocation that looks like that. All right, so our tertiary carbocation, because it's lower in energy, <coughs> what's going to be easy? What's going to be the easier reaction? The one that goes through this relatively low energy intermediate, or the one that goes through a very high energy intermediate? It's going to be the lower one. And so, because the lower energy reaction has a smaller rate determining step. <coughs> What's going to be the faster reaction? Tertiary. It's going to be the one with the lower rate determining step, right? The lower activation energy. So that's why we end up seeing the product that results from going through the more stable carbocation. Don't care about the starting material very much. We definitely don't care much about the product. What do we care about? The carbocation. All Everything is basically going to be dependent on which carbocation is more stable. That's going to lead us to the product that's actually going to form. Okay, so what we can say is that since the rate determining step is faster, we'll call this uh, written backwards in my notes. Let's say A, B. Since rate determining step is faster, for B's carbocation and A's carbocation, we would say that B is formed more quickly and thus is the favorite product. Okay, so essentially, if we're going to remember one thing from this, it's that we want to seek out the most stable carbocation, and that will give us our regiochemistry. All right, we'll box that in. So, I guess the next thing we might talk about is well, what makes, you know, what technically makes one carbocation better than the other, because we need to know what the answer to that is to ever be able to predict and determine what our products would be. And so there's going to be two things we factor in when we talk about the stability of the carbocation. So we'll call this determining carbocation stability. And honestly, one of these you definitely already know. So let's compare two things, and, and I know that you can tell me which is more stable. So the first one will show like this. <laughs> the second will show as this. Alright, so let's first talk primary, secondary, tertiary. The one on the left, that carbocation, what is it? How many carbons is it attached to? Two, so it is a? Yeah, it's a secondary carbocation. What about the one on the right? It's a tertiary carbocation. What did I just say to you about the stability between tertiary and secondary? Tertiary is more stable. Tertiary is more stable. What is one other factor that might change that in this case? Number of bonds. Oxygen. Talk about that carbocation on the left. Is it closed shell or open shell? It's actually closed shell. We can close it by having the electron pair from that oxygen nearby form a resonant structure that makes it closed shell. So now which do you think is more stable, this one or this one? The one on the left. The first thing we think about is going to be resonance. Basically, are we able to close the shell of the carbocation? You know that a closed shell structure is always more favorable than an open shell structure. And so no matter what the substitution is here, if we can close the shell to a resonant structure, that's going to be the more stable carbocation every time. And so when we talk about stability, we say um, this is going to go from left to right, more stable to less stable. And so we're going to say anytime the resonant structure is possible, we're going to end up with a more stable carbocation. The other ones 
Um, the other factor we think about is just substitution. And so essentially, the more carbons there are attached, the more stable of a carbocation. So we have a tertiary here. We then have a secondary. We have a primary. Last but not least, we end up with this guy. What do you think you call this guy? Seven. Zero. I've always heard it just referred to as a methyl cation, so that's what we'll call it. They're very unstable. It's our least stable carbocation. They're not particularly good carbocations in any way. And so what we've got are our most stable over here on the left. Here we've got our least stable. Okay, so you can see that if there's no resonance, like in these four structures on the right, basically a tertiary is more stable than a secondary, which is more stable than a primary, which is more stable than a methyl. But anytime we've got resonance, it's a possibility that will be the more stable carbocation. Okay, so this gets summarized when we do electrophilic addition reactions. I tried to find a song about this, but uh, it's, it's, it doesn't work very well. This is referred to as Markovnikov rule. I'm sorry, what? Markovnikov. Russian, I guess? I don't know. Yeah, that's definitely it's his rule, Markovnikov rule. So basically what Markovnikov rule says is that the electrophile, which in most cases that we go through a carbocation is gonna be what? Just a proton. And so the electrophile, or our proton in most cases, adds to the carbon with the most H's. And so another way of thinking that is here, I like to think of it as basically our H joins its friends. <laughs> Markovnikov rule. The H joins its friends. And so an example of Markovnikov rule would be. Uh, we could have, let's see, this structure right here. So let's react this with something like HCl. And so when we do this step right here, which carbon will this hydrogen, this proto hydrogen right here add to, the one on the left or the right? It joins its friends. Where are there more hydrogens over here, on the left or the right? It's on the right, and so that's what we see. So the more stable carbocation ends up being this one. Right, and so essentially what we see is we see the hydrogen add to this, because what if we added to this one? What kind of carbocation would we end up with? If this was a carbocation, what kind, well, what kind of carbon is it anyway, just looking at it? Primary. It's primary. What kind of carbon is this? Tertiary. It's tertiary. What's going to be the more stable carbocation? The tertiary. And so what we have in Markovnikov's rule is the hydrogen is going to add to this one. It's going to join its friends because in result, what we're going to form <laughs> is this tertiary carbocation, which is more stable. And so ultimately, we say that Markovnikov's rule is a result of forming the more stable carbocation. Okay, so we can draw another example. Let's go to the show. Let's draw. All right, so we've got an alkene here. All right, so this top carbon in the alkene, what kind of carbon is it? Tertiary. The bottom carbon is what? It's a primary, and so if we treat this with HCl, where's that proton going to go? To the top carbon or the bottom carbon? Definitely the bottom carbon. It's going to follow Markovnikov's rule. It's going to join its friends, the other H's. So the reason it does that is ultimately by doing so, it's going to go through a tertiary carbocation. And so what we find. So we end up forming that product right there. Right? So we're essentially, once we get to the middle point, we just attach our carbocation to our new nucleophile. 
so we end up with that problem. Okay, um, I guess that's it for today. So I'll send out some extra problems to go along with that, and uh, if you have questions, like I said, my availability is going to be down a little bit, but I always answer emails really quickly, so just... we could call it an electrophile because it's reacting with okay. the electrons of the of the algae, right? Okay. And so that's just we call it electrophile. But that's just, yeah. So, okay. and um, for this, do we not show the transition? Yeah. So I'm I'm leaving that part out just to save time because that can that can be a relatively complicated thing for yeah. people. To so I'm just the ones up there. Um, why is the, so wouldn't the products be the energy minimum? That's right. Since the products are down below. Yeah, but, so that'd be a global minimum, right? But okay. we do have a local minimum. Okay, so it's a local minimum. Yeah. Okay, so is the carbocation the transition state or the intermediate? So it's the intermediate because it's residing in that valley, right? The transition okay. state is basically the thing happening as we form the carbocation. Right, okay, so... This is the, the, so there's not a carbon cation in this box here. So make sure that you show that pi bond breaking as well. Uh, is, isn't that that step though? Right, so basically we're going from here to here, and so we have a pi bond here, we don't have a pi bond, and so you want to show, just like we're showing all the bonds forming and breaking, so you just draw it as dots, like, oh, like okay, okay. indicating that it's breaking. Yeah. And so then this doesn't have brackets around it, because that's the intermediate. Yeah, got it. Okay, yep. all right, that makes sense. Okay. Thanks. Hey. So there's a concept I'm like really struggling to get, and it's repeated throughout a lot of the homework, and I don't have time to come to the workshop on Wednesday, so okay. I was wondering if I could come by your office in the afternoon. What's the concept? And it's just like, I understood the chiral center when we were doing it class, but trying to put it into practice, I was just like, none of it was making sense. Okay. Um, so. Send me an email and we'll see if we can get something worked out we'll okay. a little later in the week. Okay, thank okay. you. Yep. Hi. Hi, Dr. Walk. Yes. Hi, Scott Tornick. It's Hi. Matthew Tornick. High school? We're, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if they told you, but... Yeah, I got an email, I think, uh, right before... Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, we just... Yeah. Anywhere we should sit in particular, or...? Um, no. Um, okay. Yeah, sit, sit wherever you like. Okay. Um, let's see, do you want to sell on William & Mary? Uh, we'll <laughs> yeah. Call, yeah, I actually went here as a student. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, okay. so cool. I, I teach here. All right. And uh, I, I like it, and, uh, you know, I... 
I like it a lot. Number one, um, let's see, I always, my cell is usually that, uh, so I went to the University of Michigan. For okay. Basketball. That's where yeah. I got my PhD. And so, uh, if you're an undergraduate that's interested in science, uh, I think there's two big things that, that can be beneficial to coming to here versus sure. a place like, and I love Michigan, but yeah. I think the undergraduate experience here is better. So number one, you know, everyone here that teaches, they're undergraduate focused. They, they basically want to teach undergrad. They're okay. here because of that. Right? Okay. Um, they, they As opposed to research? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, they still do research. And that's basically number two, is that the research that's done here, that in reality is very good, it's... It's all undergraduates that do the research. And so if you go to Michigan, honestly, the, the opportunity to, to do research, it, it was a little bit limited because, you know, they've got two undergraduate students that do the bulk of the work. I and see. so you kind of get funneled into cleaning dishes and, and doing a lot of the secondary minor stuff. Here, the faculty depend on you to do the research. You are right. the main person. You end up with the first author paper. And so, you know, I think that, I think you come out of a place like William Mary, especially William Mary, with a, a, a much better background in doing research if you're interested in Okay. And what about like, you know, people who go into uh, clinical practice? Yeah. Is that? Um, so it is, I mean, it is what you, what you make of it. I think that, uh, you know, I think Michigan, I think I've seen a stat where Michigan produces the most pre-med students in, in the country, but a lot of that has to do with the fact that Michigan's a huge school. Right, right, right. There's right. a lot of people. Yeah. I think that, I think that students here, in terms of success rate of going into medicine, are yeah. common. Sure. You know, I, I, I don't think, think so. you can, and especially you do get the better, the better research experience. So, right, right, you know, right. Ultimately, med schools they they don't they, they like to see variety, right? And, and yeah. you don't have to have a science background. There's a lot of other things you can get involved here. That, right, right. Again, you're going to be the person doing the research. Yeah. So, okay. I love great. This so, okay, that's yeah. great. It's a beautiful campus. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, if you have any other questions, feel free to email me. Okay. Um, sure. I, I kind of got both perspectives of, of the faculty as well as the students. No, it's great that you went so, here. That's that's yeah. really helpful. Yeah. So, cool. Okay. Good. Awesome. Thanks. Right. Enjoy class. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. See what I can do.